matter. We began our last episode by discussing the basic question as to why questions of um, epistemological uh, nominalism are important for political control uh, and why, why nominalism as a concept is so central to your critique of kind of the modern and um, Enlightenment rationalist age and even before that the Western milieu which it came out of. So why don't we begin there and why don't we answer the question why is epistemological nominalism important for political control and what is nominalism? Well, I'm glad you put it that way because, you know, no one was talking about this 20 years ago when I started talking about it. And now it's, you know, everyone who's read, you know, Aristotle in college uh, is talking about how nominalism is the the chasm separating the medieval from the modern. Um, and, you know, it's something that, I mean, I knew of no one at the time making that claim. Uh, if they exist, they were very obscure. Um now it's, it's very common. Um, well, let's start off with the definition of the term. You know how philosophers are. You know, they don't really have a lot to do all day long. So, you know, they, big state university, they teach a class now and again. So they make ever finer and finer distinctions. Uh, distinctions with, without much of a difference. I'm not going to engage in that at all. Nominalism is and always has been the notion that Universal meaning doesn't exist outside of our minds. That we are purposeless, that there can be no truth, at least no abiding truth. Um, that we are isolated individuals, that everything we do with each other is accidental. Uh, even the family, because that becomes dangerously close to, to uh, a universal. Um, they struggle with the idea of numbers. Numbers really trip up the, the nominalist mentality, which, of course, Plato had, had spoken about 2,500 years ago. But um, before I, you know, this was the, the, the main guy in, in the modern era. There were a few pre-Socratics who talked about it, but but uh, William of Ockham, uh, Franciscan in England, developed the notion, you know, really breaking with, with the Thomas. And it's not an accident that he, he wasn't a, a Dominican. Uh, that... Essences don't exist. Now, I use words like essence or form or archetype. They're synonymous. These are the abiding realities that exist in God's mind as he created the world, and he did it through logos that contains all the forms of Plato. Um, even William of, William of Ockham says, although I don't know why he bothers to mention this, that forms exist in God's mind. I don't know how he knows that. But one of the real cardinal errors that make, make William such a perverse figure um, is, is um, first of all, we have no idea, you know, why he makes that claim or how he knows this, except maybe he's just trying to save, save the theory. But he posits a huge, huge, huge separation between God and man. It ends up being pure voluntarism. Something is good because God wills it. There are no sta- – any, any mention of an eternal standard – um, goes out the window. We talk about something like original sin, for example. And this I got from Charles, Charles Colum many years ago. Um, uh, you see, that's, that's how you cite sources, you know. Charles Colum made the argument that, um, you can't talk about original sin unless you have a concept of human nature. Nominalism can't be true. You can't be a Christian anomalous at least for that reason. Because what was it that was damaged such that it gets passed on? It was a singular human nature. How can you possibly talk about Chalcedon or how can you talk about Christ at all without making reference to a divine nature and a human nature that operate in one form or another? You can't. The, this is why God chose the Greek language. Christianity is a Greek religion at its root. Um, it's not Semitic, it's Greek. Uh, and, and Greece had one of the greatest vocabularies for metaphysics. And it's not an accident that, that God chose the, that group of people. And, uh, and I think the language has a lot to do with it because the concept of nature or, or archetype is deep in the, in the mentality of, of um, the post-Platonic world. And Plato, of course, was the one who brought it to, to the, the height and, and, and then Plotinus afterwards uh, may even have improved on it, at least as a, as a mathematician. And um, But only in the modern world do you get this notion that 
So let's, for example, John Locke, who's another major figure after after uh, after Occam, a few centuries after Occam, um, that the natural world really doesn't exist. It's a flux of nothing, because his theory of property says that something becomes yours when you mix your labor with something out in that flux, some raw material. You make something out of it. That creates value. That creates reality. So what is that stuff before you mix your labor with it? It isn't anything. It has no value. It has, I mean, this is, this is the core of industrialization. The only thing that has value or meaning are those things that we create, or really the elite create, um, out of this flux of what we call nature. They have no abiding reason. It's, it's just, it's just they, they're, they're useful. And there's no other purpose beyond that. And that's this dead, um, mindless world that, that moderns have created. And that's what, that's the default setting. You know, I mean, epistemology is, is essential. Most people don't understand why it's essential, but epistemology is assumed in every sentence we utter. Um, you know, uh, the, the assumption for most Americans, whether they know it or not, is that the, the isolated individual is the only thing that exists. Um, there's really nothing above that. They can't even conceive of it. And, and even, you know, very intelligent people can't, it's such a, such a ingrained conception. It informs everything they, they say and do. And even for us, it's really hard to break out of that. You have to isolate yourself. Um, but studying the fathers and especially things like Chalcedon, you cannot possibly, uh, be anomalous and be a Christian. It's the ultimate pan heresy because something like Chalcedon makes absolutely no sense. Adam's fall makes no sense. Nothing in the faith makes sense unless you accept the idea of universals and real forms nature's abiding in, in creation. Well said. <clears throat> and so I think that the link here for, to kind of extrapolate a little bit for our listeners, is that um, the most p- potent tool for engaging in political control is the manipulation of worldviews. Like Stanford Research Institute released a very famous paper called, it was um, on the changing images of man, talking all about how psychological warfare um, in in the practice of that, it was essential to control man's own self-image and his place in the cosmos, how he viewed himself in relationship to the rest of the universe. And so inserting the nominalist ideas of individualism and of the, the lack of um, symbolic or semiotic reality, the lack of universal categories, is at the foundation, absolutely, at the foundation of political control. And so um, the... The example that I used the last time as the total opposite, and certainly most appropriately for the Orthodox Church, is the liturgy, where um, in the traditional Orthodox understanding, we have a whole chain of being uh, proceeding back into the Logos, whereby these divine uh, universal forms, the Logoi, which are uh, penetrate the reality around us, provide this ability for um, superlative referent in the sense that when we interact with a certain uh, symbol or like an icon, we are actually interacting with a, cer- a metaphysical reality that it represents behind it. It is, as you say, uh, a gateway into a higher reality, the opposite of the vapidity that the term symbol now possesses. And so in the liturgy, all of man's human energies are directed in a symbolic expression towards the divine. And the whole, the whole purpose of this is to enable communion with the divine personality, the divine community. And so what happens is that when this metaphysical superstructure, the, the symbolic reality that enables our human activities to be directed in a transcendental fashion is severed from us philosophically. When we make the statement that no, these um, actions and gestures and words and forms are not inherently meaningful. They're not a reflection of some uncreated reality, but they are just the arbitrary uh, shorthand and kind of uh, post hoc rationalizations that come out of the chaotic flux of churning matter. And then that means that the liturgy, symbology, metaphysical realism, it, it all totally falls apart. And once this is gone, there, there can be no stable philosophical basis to make claims of transcendental justice. And so if you remove this ability to even conceptualize of some sort of universal state of right order, which can be appealed to for readdress from wrongs, 
Uh, it's an extremely profound and useful tool in the inaction of tyranny.